when I saw Sylvester. My life was altered, my life was changed for the better. As a black, queer, gay man, any glimmer of seeing one's self reflected back at them through our culture changes lives. Sylvester was born Sylvester James in 1947 in South Central Los Angeles. He was raised primarily by his mother and his grandmother. I think that Sylvester's mom was herself fabulous. She was very, very involved in the church, and I think it really is that environment, presenting yourself to others in a way that is really beautiful and sort of extravagant that she passed on to her kids. My grandmother was like his idol. He, she just loved the way she dressed and the way she carried herself. And that trickled down to my mother. And um, they accepted him for who he was. Sylvester's interest in what we would now call gender fluidity started very early. He was not interested in sports. He was singing high and girlishly in church. He would sing around the house in his room, like Etta James, and he would come in and play songs, and he and my mother would sit and sing these songs, and then he would play big band music, and they would do the foxtrot, and he would pick my mother up and swing her around, and oh, my mother, and he was so close. Mm, let's go, shake it. Sylvester moved to San Francisco because he felt like he could really be himself. You know, the Castro District was a place where most of your, your gays and lesbians lived, and he felt more at home there. Of course, back then, a lot of that was not accepted, but he didn't care. He said, you be you no matter what. I'm going to be me. They either like me or they don't. I was sitting at a piano on stage at the Palace Theater and just noodling away. And Sylvester came and sat next to me and had a lot of jewelry on, clickety-clack bracelets. I didn't know that he was a guy. He just had this rapport. I had a 1938 Buick. So he would sit in the back wearing a fur chubby and wave out the window to guys in the Castro. Come here, honey. What's your name? Sylvester was invited to join an underground gaggle of psychedelic, amateur, mostly gay, stage-struck hippies that was called the Cockettes. And for him, it was a period of evolution, and he was trying things out. I don't know that Sylvester enjoyed doing the sketch comedy. I think his favorite part of any show was when he had a solo spot. He loved being uh, the center of attention. <laughs> Sylvester definitely wanted to be a separate act from the Cockettes by that time in 1971 when he formed his hot band. When I saw Sylvester for the first time, I just thought it was amazing. I had never seen any kind of artist like that before. I was going to see Billy Preston at the Berkeley Community Theater. The opening act was Sylvester. I think I stood <laughs> through his whole show because <laughs> I'm saying to myself, who the hell is this guy? And where did he come from? I had never seen anything like him before, not knowing that a few years later, I would go and audition for him. That was a surprise. Martha sang about four lines and I looked up at Sylvester and he looked at me and we just looked at each other like, who in the hell is that? That's how impressed we were by Martha Wash. When Sylvester found Martha Wash and Isora Rhodes, it was as if he had found the home that would allow him to be free again, partly because he was returning to church 
These were church singers. They were on either side of him, giving him the freedom to just be up front and free. It was the sound that he knew from childhood brought into a queer environment. It was like it all fell into place. Now this is Sylvester on now. This is Sylvester right now. It's a certain beat, it's an alternating rhythm. Oh yeah, man, it just gets people moving, you know. Really cooking. Well, I would just hear about Sylvester from friends. They'd say, do you hear he's got this record play on the radio and everything? Sylvester and I were just, all we were trying to do is get on the radio. Because to get on the radio was to work. Dance Disco he was always my favorite. That's a whole nother thing. <laughs> Mighty Real was his biggest hit. I wrote the music at home on the guitar and I presented the song to Sylvester. He liked it. He wrote the lyrics at a rehearsal. Patrick Kelly had gotten a hold of a rehearsal tape and he layered all his synthesizer layers into it. Sylvester went down and heard the demo and immediately said, I want that on my record. You know, like any hit, it's really unpredictable. <laughs> you know, it just happened to be what people responded to and then it was off like a rocket. The man you're about to hear is one of the most theatrical and flamboyant performers on the disco scene. You know his big hits. You make me feel mighty real and dance disco heat. And now, here is that bizarre star, the sensational Sylvester! I think it was a surprise to everybody. Um, but a happy surprise. That song took us all over the world. We were able to do more TV shows. I had always been a Merv Griffin fan. Well, you're in for a big musical surprise. It is thought to be true that people from the Big Apple have seen it all, but I guarantee that my next guest will wake up New York. Sit back, get ready for the disco sounds live on our stage of Sylvester and his tons of fun. I remember when I first saw Sylvester performing on TV, I just sat there quietly and cried while everyone else was in the background screaming and they couldn't believe that here he was. It was very exciting, very emotional. And immediately after that, I called him up, you know, so you did it, I can't believe you, <laughs> you did it. And then he told me there's much more to come. He crossed over. He was a gender fluid black man in mainstream music. That hasn't happened since. There have been a lot of us who have tried, and I've been trying for 30 years. Nobody did it like Sylvester. The San Francisco Opera House was the pinnacle of legitimate music. In fact, it was the home of the San Francisco Symphony. Performing at the San Francisco Opera House was huge, absolutely huge. We were the first disco act or popular music act to ever perform in the San Francisco Opera House with the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra. With the symphony? Yes. The first time. Right. Ever. All kinds of people, all types of people came to this show. They came in tuxes, ball gowns, and anything else in between. The Dracula. symphony players are really straight. Yeah. Straight. Oh, I see. Well, I mean, you I know. <laughs> you know how classical musicians are. It was in the contract that he could not use glitter because it got stuck in the cracks of the floor. So what did he do? So what I did to make them uh, loosen up a little bit, just before the curtain, I saved this just before the curtain went up, and I ran around backstage and I threw pounds of glitter all on their hair, all on their instruments, oh, all over everything. Oh, they must have loved that. They did love it. They played great. Midway through the Opera House show, Harry Britt, representing the city, gave Sylvester, in front of everybody, the keys to the city and declared it Sylvester Day. It was not just a musical event, it was kind of a sociocultural event and also like recovery for San Francisco from 
a number of traumas that San Francisco had been suffering from. So the Jonestown massacre and the assassinations of Harvey Milk and George Moscone. And of course, Harvey Milk had been a supporter of Sylvester. It was the year of a lot of anti-gay legislation that people were pushing through. It was a very, very ugly and traumatic time. When Sylvester played the opera house, really just after that trauma, he brought people together and reminded them that we are happy with who we are. We celebrate who we are. He got people singing Mighty Real all together in one room, slowed down like a hymn. You know, there was something so healing about that moment. In 1978 and 79, as disco was really hitting its peak, so was the backlash against disco. Then it became very frowned upon. You know, this whole idea. No, 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 no more of that. That's, that's not cool anymore. And it really came to a head in Disco Demolition Night in Comiskey Park in Chicago when a radio DJ pulled together a bunch of disco albums and literally blew them up. My 16-year-old says disco's over. Oh, I wouldn't say that. People are still out every night, lines and lines, and people and people still dancing, so I don't think it's dead at all. It's just changing. A lot of artists just, you know, ended up in the cold. Not Sylvester, though. I mean, disco was not the be-all and end-all for him ever. He was just so much more than disco. And the term disco artist, when it came to be a pejorative, did not apply to him. Sylvester was always ahead of us. He did things like talked about being married to a man. This before gay marriage was a thought. He responded to Joan Rivers saying that he was this drag queen by saying, but I'm not a drag queen, I'm Sylvester. He wasn't saying there's something wrong with being a drag queen. He was saying, that's not how gender works. It was gender fluidity and non-binary gender before we were really there. Sylvester was always uh, pretty much an open book. He, he, that was part of his character. He, he did not hold back, obviously. And uh, it's kind of like, why would I start holding back now if I haven't held back my entire life and my entire career? So to him, it was just the logical step. Yeah, I've got it, I'm sick. I remember the day very well when Sylvester told me that he was sick and I asked him sick like what and he said that uh, I I have AIDS. Coming out in public one of his last appearances in a wheelchair in San Francisco in the Pride Parade he put a human face to us he moved the conversation forward and reminded the world that there are human beings that embody this disease. Don't forget. Never forget. All right. Oh, I just, there's, there's no way to not get emotional and there's also no way to not dance along to that. So the next piece of footage that we're going to show is um, a piece of footage that was recorded in, uh, I believe, 1985 
Uh, this is video of what was waggishly billed as uh, the 40th birthday celebration for Sylvester, even though he was only uh, 38 at the time. So it features him performing standards backed by a jazz band. And this was uh, restored recently by uh, media preservationist John Raines, who has helped us out doing a lot of wonderful video for the society. So I'll bring that over here. And um, we'll all just enjoy and celebrate uh, the birthday of Sylvester. He recently, uh, his birthday was on the 6th of September and he would have been 73. Welcome. Welcome to my 40th birthday party. Yes, it's true. The doll is 40 years old today. Do I look okay? Yeah. Now you must be wondering why I'm in this drag and all this. It's because um, the music that I want to do is uh, special music and it's something that I don't get a, a chance to do all the time. Um, and it's, it's, it's just real uh, a fantasy for me. And I'm glad you're all here to enjoy it. So it's a total illusion, okay? It's not even about drag, it's just a total illusion, okay? As many of you know, I'm getting ready to go on Broadway in the lead in La Casha Foe, so I'm just practicing. So uh, you might as well get used to it because I'll be making lots of bucks doing it, so it's okay. Uh, anyway, I'd like to uh, do a, a, a medley of songs for you that I, I think are exceptionally fabulous. And... Uh, well, it tells a little story, and then if you uh, listen carefully, you'll get the story. It goes like this. It's And we looked at each other in the same way then. I can remember where I went. The clothes you were wearing. Were the same clothes you wore, and the smile you were smiling, you were smiling there. I can remember when. Well, Where 
been offered a date in New York. Fabulous. I'd like to sing for you now one of my very favorite songs. It was recorded first by Miss Billie Holiday. It's called Lover Man, Where Can You Be?
I hope you enjoyed that. Good night. I love you. Thank you very much. Let's bring Sylvester back. Come on, Sylvester. Let's get him back up here for one more. Yeah, come on up, Sylvester. One more time. Thank you. I know this might be a little different for some of you, and those of you that are on speed, well, you just have to calm down for a minute. This is a party, right? And we're going to leave you with this. Uh, this is a party. We've tried to make the night a special night and make the mood a special mood. Uh, it's a cabaret. It's a party. Think about Paris in the 20s, New York in the 30s, San Francisco in the 40s. I know you can do that. Dig this. This is going to make you laugh. Goes like this. What could you shut down alone in your room? Come hear the music play. Don't you know what I give the cowbell? Ray O'Charles. Come on, come on, come on to the cabaret. Somebody make town up from cradle to mouth.
is awfully heavy. I want everybody to have a piece of the cake. It's like having a piece of the rock. <laughs> Eat it all, okay? I'm gonna come and cut this cake later. I love you all so much, thank you. Thank you. I want you to have a fabulous evening. I'm gonna go do a costume change and change into my um, butcher's drag. Just to let you know, we have something for everyone. They have this and we have that and we have the other. And drag is drag. Uh, $600 worth of leather and a $600 dress is the same as drag. All right? I love you. God bless you all. Thank you so much. This is my home and I love you. Thank you. And to close the 1985 Cable Car Awards and Show, would you welcome the one and only Sylvester. <laughs> Oh. Mm -hmm. 
And there you have it. So now I would like to welcome up our wonder my wonderful coworker, our wonderful registrar and collections manager, Ramon Silvestri, who will be talking to us a little bit about the items that we have in our Sylvester collection. We originally wanted to do a, a video showcasing some of these items, but unfortunately with the COVID restrictions, we weren't able to get into the archives, but we've created a nice little slideshow with some images and we're hoping that it will be a fun time for you. So let me bring Ramon right up on the screen. Hi, Ramon. Hi everyone. Thank Hello. you very much for joining us tonight. And um, I know my last name sounds like Sylvester. It's so close, but not as, as flamboyant, I guess is the word, or not as dressed up. But uh, I would like to just, you know, thank Lee as well and Terry for, you know, and all of you to, to come tonight and, and, and enjoy the show. Um, I also want to share with you that the, the um, last film clip you saw, we have several of those that we have just recently digitized on our website. So we would like to invite you all to kind of peruse the collection because we've gotten more robust in terms of our collections online. So please feel free to uh, check that out. Also, um, if there are questions about, you know, the Sylvester collection, for example, specifically, write me an email and you can access that email address on our website as well. So um, without further ado, I think what I'd like to talk about first is um, Sylvester was all about high fashion drama. So, you know, the white fur coats, the vintage movie star beading and satin, the disco sequence and every kind of indulgent embellishment. So his his costumes were really amazing. And I also would like to further thank uh, Tony Bravo from San Francisco Chronicle that had written an article and will show you a few of these photographs that is that the photographer Liz Safalia had taken um, uh, with about, I mean, taken photographs of these collections. So, um, Lee, we can go to the next slide. So here you see him in the beaded sequin top that um, was designed by Pat Campano. I guess he was a local San Francisco designer who also designed for um, Diana, Diana Ross and the Supremes. Is that, am I right? Yeah, I think so. So, um, and this is the whole pantsuit. So the Historical Society had loaned this. Um, we've been very active in, in terms of exhibition loans to other institutions all over the world, including just this recently, this whole pantsuit had traveled to Germany for an exhibit on queer California, along with the larger exhibit that was in the Oakland Museum called Queer California. So that, sequin top is the blue one that is going to be following as well. So um, this one, so this one, oh, sorry. This one was featured at the Oakland Museum's exhibit Queer California last year. And the Historical Society was one of the larger um, lenders to the exhibit. Um, we tried to be generous about this. Um, with other institutions so we could share this treasures with you all. Um, about, let me just go back to, yes, this one, Diana Ross and the Supremes. Uh, Pat Campano was the designer. So he was f famous for all these heavily sequined costumes that he, he did for a number of, of entertainers at this time. Um, Next slide, Lee. Here's a cape that was used in the 1980s as well. So you are well, I mean, you know, you could, you could always, when, when, when the whole um, virus pandemic is over, uh, we would like to invite you all to at least come visit us or set up an appointment to see the collection or the archives and do some research if you might be interested. 
Lee, next slide. And then this was um, a costume he had worn when he had joined the Coquettes. So it's it's the older it's an older piece that we acquired. Um, just to mention that um, we had the first batch of of costumes we you see right here was donated to the Historical Society in the nineties by um, the Project Open Hand and um, yes Project Open Hand and um, I'm sorry, I'm losing track of my notes here. And and later on, in the last two years, uh, we were um, we were um, sorry. Um, his sister Bernadette, who lives in Los Angeles, reached out to us through Josh Gamson, Gamson, who's our biographer and professor of sociology at USF. And so myself and our managing archivist at that time flew down to Los Angeles to meet with Bernadette, his youngest sister, to acquire a number of his personal, memor personal memorabilia. He did a lot of, um, he, he designed his own accessory. So somewhere down in the slides, you'll see that too. So Lee, can we have the next slide, please? And then, oh, right there. So. This is also a collection. So this is more of a homage to an Asian inspired costume. So you can see a fusion of the Japanese Chinese sort of um, design on these also fully sequined top. It's, it's, it's nice to, and then of course he loved the, um, the, the, the designs of of um, headdresses from the 30s and 40s. So this was definitely a, a, a PC he really liked to use with his performances. Next slide, Lee. And then this is a collection of gloves. This is a later addition to the collection. This was a collection of vintage gloves that he had put in a shadow box that was displayed at his home. And so his sister was very generous to send this to us uh, to be part of the collection on, on, on Sylvester that we have, currently have. So um, we have a lot more, unfortunately, with, with the pandemic, we can't access the collection at the archives, but we do have a few of his uh, platinum records, some photographs, some family photographs, and, uh, record albums that he had, or at least had been produced during his time. So, um, is that the last slide, Lee? I think it is. Yep. So, um, can I, uh, I, I, I guess I should have you, uh, if any questions are there, and, yeah, uh, we'd we'd love to. Uh, the next part of this program was going to be Ken Jones uh, coming in to tell some stories about Sylvester. But as uh, Terry said up at the top, he unfortunately had to back out of tonight's program. But we're happy to have folks share their stories. Um, some people said some really wonderful things in the chat. If you would like to come up on microphone and tell uh, your story uh, briefly please um, just hit the little raise hand button and we'll be able to bring you up. And we would love to hear people's stories about Sylvester. If you saw him perform, if you uh, had your hair done by him, like Sharon talked about, uh, we'd love to hear. And I'm sure that Ramon would be happy to answer any questions about the process of accessioning the collection that we have. So let me look at our participants here. All right, Tony W, you've got your hand up. Would you like to come up on screen? I can do that for you, or on the on the audio. Oh, that's, let's see this. Hi, Tony W. I'm gonna unmute him. Asking to unmute. 
All right. Well, I think I think that's a, a mistaken hand. Um, but so we had some really wonderful chat comments. Um, we've got from oh, you know what? We've got let's see. Well, we have Danny Nicoletta online. We've got, give us just one moment. We're going to scroll back up on the chat. So uh, Steve Richmond said on Sundays in San Francisco, Sylvester and the Two Tons of Fun would perform at the Elephant Walk. They and the band would have to fit in a small, the small cigarette slash wait staff room near the back of the bar. And the place was so full, people would be out in the street trying to see and hear the fabulous Sylvester and the Two Tons of Fun. We've got William here. Uh, with their hand raised. So William, I'm going to bring you up and ask you to unmute. Hi, William. Hello Hi. there. Am I unmuted? You are yes, unmuted. You are. Hi. Awesome. This is such a treasure of reminiscence and memory <laughs> and celebration. And my quick story is, I think I was 20 years old and I was working at the Gucci boutique on Maiden Lane. And there was this little teeny restaurant on the second floor um, of a building on Maiden Lane. And it was called the Mayfair. And it was where all the little old blue haired high society women ate. And one day I grabbed a quick lunch there and suddenly the elevator doors of the Mayfair opened and there was Sylvester in a full length white fox coat with two men in black leather on either side of him. And you should have seen all those little old high society San Francisco <laughs> matrons <laughs> drop their champagne cocktails and their chicken a la king. Everybody gasped at the same time. It was just fabulous. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for that story. Sure. Um, Sharon. That was some, a great, yeah, that, back there had a really, story is great. <laughs> Sharon in the chat had a really wonderful story. I was wondering if maybe uh, Sharon could come up and, and press the raise your hand button and I can bring you up to talk. Uh, but in the meantime, we have, uh, before that, we've got John. I'm going to put you up. Hi, John. Hi. How are you doing? Great. How about you? Good. What That's stories quick. do you have to tell us? Well, I, I live in San Francisco. I moved there here in 1969, and I was this is the early early to mid 70s, maybe around 74. I was on the Sonic Avenue hitchhiking, and Sylvester picked me up. He was in his little Volkswagen. I think it had the Mercedes Benz grill, and he picked me up with his then boyfriend blowing red hair. His name is Jimmy. <laughs> he uh, said, we're going to go mattress shopping at Sears. You want to go with us? So I did. So I had the, the most bizarre, fun time with Sylvester and Jimmy watching them try all the mattresses at Sears and shocking all the customers. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. At the Gay Pride Parade in 1976, he dressed up as Jane Mansfield. I thought <laughs> P and I together on that during that parade on, on your website. Uh, I saw countless times through the year, so many times I can't remember. Anyway, th those are my stories for now. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing them. Sure. All right. So, so Sharon, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring she, you up, or once once Ramon talks here. I don't know. Has Sharon kind of raised her hand? Sharon has raised her hand. I'm She's gonna... an amazing story she should share. All right, Sharon, I'm gonna bring you up to talk here. Hi. Hi, Sharon. How are you? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm good. This is absolutely fantastic. It has brought back so many fun memories to me. Um, back in the mid and late 60s, uh, Sylvester was doing hair 
And I had the wonderful opportunity to meet him through some mutual friends of ours. And he found out that I had a nightclub act at the time in which I danced with snakes. And um, yeah, so he, um, I found out that he did hair. He was wonderful at doing hair. And uh, he did my hair a few times for a photo shoot that I had um, in around Los Angeles. And uh, we got to hang out a few times. And this was all prior to, I had no idea at the time he was as talented as he was in terms of singing. And uh, it was just amazing getting to know him. And then of course, I was traveling around the country doing my act and, and watching him become Sylvester. And it was just so amazing. And, and he, I, I just wish those people that don't know him had the opportunity just to spend some time with him. Funny, um, just, just the best person you would ever want to meet. And I just, I, wow, I, this is just so, this is really overwhelming, but it's such a beautiful tribute. And um, I just want to thank everybody involved. We, those of us who knew him, um, we really appreciate this. And I know that he's smiling and laughing and enjoying it. Um, so thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much for sharing your story. That's that's one heck of a story to be able to tell people that you you knew him back when and he did your hair before you even knew that he was a huge disco star. So that's uh, certainly going to be a fun one at parties. Um, so we actually have a couple of questions in the Q and A. Um, so we had somebody uh, asking uh, Ramon. I know that we had mentioned briefly that what we showed was only a small amount of what we have mm -hmm. in the yes. collection. Um, someone has asked, uh, how many Sylvester, co uh, how many Sylvester costumes do we have I in the archives? Roughly my count right now is about the major ones with, se with um, the fully beaded and sequined ones. I think we at least have half a dozen of those, half a dozen of that, of that series. Now the last, the second part of the collection we had acquired in the last two or three years were more personal memorabilia, like his hair accessories. His sister sent us that um, shadow box of vintage gloves that sat in his home as part of, uh, you know, as a, as a framed piece in his, in his house. And uh, there's a few, you know, we have a lot of family photos. Um, if I remember correctly, there was a lot of awards, you know, platinum records he received from, like, I remember one that came from uh, a German recording company because he performed all over, you know, the country and all over the world. And he had, um, his songs kind of got to the point where these recording companies were producing awards like platinum record awards that were being sent to him. And the family estate the estate was very generous to um, send that to us as well so um, you know it'd be great to have you come visit and we can show you what else there is in the collection wonderful um someone also asked uh so i'm actually relatively new to the society but i don't think we have in the past um someone asked was there or will there ever be an exhibition i don't remember i don't think that we've had an exhibition specifically on sylvester yeah. we had a feat we just featured like the the pink sequin pantsuit that he that you've seen in the film clips we had put on an exhibit at the museum a few years back um on um i think that exhibition was called legendary and what we did there was we featured a all like all African American personalities that 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 we have in the collection, and one of that was Sylvester's costume. 
So no, that that's a great idea. I think eventually we could plan on hopefully getting that on an exhibit sometime. Yeah, it'd be really, really neat to mount something like that. I know that people really enjoyed being able to see uh, Gilbert Baker's costumes, which was the exhibition that we had up before yeah. the museum closed due to COVID-19. It'd be really, I know that I went and I saw the Queer California exhibit yeah. that we partnered with the Oakland Museum of California on and just seeing the blue sequin jacket just right there as in the speakers, uh, Mighty Real is playing was very, very touching and very emotional. Uh, we have a, a question here from Danny Nicoletta. Hi guys, thanks for the Hi, great Danny. program. Uh, can you tell us where the two videos that are now part of the collection that you showed tonight came from and what format they were in? So mm. the first video that we showed actually isn't part of our collection. It's available on YouTube. It uh, is through, it was done through Amazon Music, and so you can actually just find it online. We'll post a link in the chat for you and on Facebook for those of you who are watching through our live stream, but it's very easy to see. You can, you know, share it widely because it's, it's available on YouTube. In terms of the second video that we showed, that is part of our collection, and as I mentioned in the chats, it is, uh, it has been digitized and is part of our digital collection available on Diva through San Francisco State. Um, so I put a link in the chats, but uh, you can also go to our website and uh, look at our online collections and find it there as well. And I'm sure Danny Nicoletta has stories about, he's taken pictures of, if, if everyone know, doesn't know this, Danny Nicoletta is a photographer who's, who's worked with Crawford Barton, taken amazing historical photographs of, of um, of Harvey Milk along with Sylvester. So he does have a book. I'm doing this plug, but he has a wonderful book on on uh, queer San Francisco. And uh, if you have time, you should peruse that that photography book. It's an amazing collection of historical photographs and yeah. taken by him in San Francisco. <laughs> And we actually have, we have uh, Danny with a uh, hand raised. So Danny, I'm gonna bring <laughs> you up here. Let me, there you go. Hi, Danny. Hi, Hi everybody. Danny. Uh, so nice to see you all again. It's a pleasure to have you on too. Thank you. <laughs> um, the one little tidbit that I, nobody knows is that, you know, when I was a baby gay studying my <laughs> freshman year at, Kansas City Art Institute, some of the people in the, the, uh, the dorm were muttering about this thing called the coquettes, and of course my ears pricked right up. And, um, and they were all gonna go see this band called Sylvester and the Hot Band at the, uh, the Kansas City Cowtown Ballroom at where a lot of the rock shows were and I went along and so I got to see Sylvester and the Hot Band, you know, and that's his rock period. There's actually two albums of that music that are just breathtaking and uh, his look was very different. It was sort of a hybrid of the Coquettes energy, but also, I don't know, it was almost kind of country and western with tight, tight, tight jeans and, you know, you can see the album covers, uh, probably Google them and uh, see his look back then, but he was truly a chameleon. And uh, I, I had the good fortune of sort of following his trajectory and trying to get a little groupy shot now and then. Uh, shot him at the Castro Street Fair, shot him at Gay Pride. Oh God, what else? Um, yeah, uh, there's two shots of him in my book uh, that are beautiful. And uh, yeah, I, I miss him. I'm sad to see him go. He was kind of iconic uh, in the neighborhood and uh, approachable, you know, lovely, lovely person. Yeah, if you, uh, if you actually, if you happen to be uh, in San Francisco and out, you know, doing errands, hopefully masked mm -hmm. and socially distanced, uh, <laughs> there is actually, Sylvester has a plaque on the Rainbow Honor Walk as well. So you can go see that on uh, Castro Street and, you know, take, take selfies with it. It's, it's really fun to see him uh, immortalized along with all of these other wonderful queer heroes. 
thank you so much for for sharing your story danny you bet all right and we've got uh i'm gonna bring up david next i think sylvester just paved the way for other hey, fashion and gender re rebelling pop stars of of color who followed him like you know prince and exactly, grace jones yeah. and you know current ones like Jaden smith and janelle monet mm -hmm. <laughs> i think he was sure ahead of his time absolutely i'm hi, sorry David. David. welcome in hi hi um i was a good friend of sylvester's and i used to design a lot of his clothing and yeah, i um, saw you talking in the chat about some of that tell us tell us some some of these stories well um where, where do i start um, <laughs> You know, I met him in the Coquette years because I went to high school with um, Dahlia, who was, they dubbed as the prettiest Coquette. And that's how I m met the whole Coquette scene was through a high school mate, believe it or not. And I met Sylvester through the Coquettes. Um, and I was just starting uh, painting silks and turning them into long robed kimonos, caftans, you know, ponchos flowing. It was the seventies. So that oversized, beautiful, you know, fabric, luxuriant kind of holster me, uh, square cut, easy, simple shapes was very popular. And, you know, with my own unique fabrics, it set it apart. And Sylvester loved my work and he bought a lot of pieces from me. And um, one night, went to the design center and I was wearing a, a red deco uh, silk kimono and I walked backstage and Sylvester looked at me and his mouth dropped and he said I have to have it and <laughs> he bought it and he bought it from me and he performed in it that night on, at the design center so that was like amazing I was actually crying in the balcony because that was like a moment for me <laughs> That was really exciting. And um, and he'd send me postcards from when he did his European tour from every place. And it would never be about him. He'd always say, you know, they loved your teal, uh, the, the teal one in, in Paris. Um, you know, the blue one with the, with the fans was a big hit in, in Italy, you know. And he'd always put it on me. He was such a sweet, caring person. I mean, he used to come over and sit watch TV with me and my mom and my sister. It was just like, you know, he was just like, a, you know, he was just like a person. <laughs> um, and so we knew him before the hits came. In fact, my brother and sister went to high school with Martha Wash and they were in the choir with her and in poly, at Polytechnic. And um, so I'd known or seen Martha Wash before she became one of two tons of fun. And so I was all kind of interconnected to, to this. And I guess I was at the right place at the right time. And it was, you know, I know that um, Jeannie Tracy has some of, the, some of my pieces. He left them to her. And I think the other ones, I don't know if they're in your archives, um, I believe were left to his mother and sisters. Is there anything in your archive or your showing that is hand painted silk? I don't think we do, David. I would love to have you if you have any photographs, you know, that you could maybe send us copies of or, you know, that sort of thing. We would love we would love to have you share that with us. Um, well, the, rea the reality is and this is the terrible thing to bring up is uh, many years ago the GLBT Center did a show for Sylvester when they were on Market Street many years ago. Yep. And I lent all of my like signed albums and he was on the cover of Cashbox magazine and in one of my outfits. And um, I had layouts of how the kimonos were laid out, painted and, you know, like very personal things. And they were all stolen and I never got them back. <laughs> Oh no. Oh no, that's so awful. Like, and I've had the the historical society look, you know, two or three times, they can't find them. So 
somebody obviously was looking right for them. Mm. And um, I did hear that somewhere where um, some of the, I, I can't pass blame, but I heard that there was a, a coquette conspiracy where they're trying to collect up everything about them. And maybe it was for people that are writing the books. I don't know for sure. <clears throat> but <laughs> I know it is kind of a scandal. But anyway, this oh has nothing God. to do with Sylvester. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, it does because, you know, I lost my thing. And the main thing was just the things that are assigned personally to me. Yeah, of course. Are, how heartbreaking. Yeah, that was because he'd write, keep up with your, you know, keep up with your design, you know. Um, you know, that, those are the kinds of things he would write. Wow. And he was, a, he was a sweetheart. And, um, and you know, fame didn't, you know, really change him at all. You know, he still was Sylvester. Yeah, so, he's, he's very, very charismatic and, and just a loving presence up on the stage there. Um, so we have, we have a few more minutes. We have one other person with their hand up. And then uh, I guess we can take any, any last remaining questions and leave you all to the rest of your evening. So uh, Jeffrey Senna, I'm going to bring you up here in just a moment. Hi, Jeffrey, Hello. go ahead. Hi. Hi. Yes, um, I just have like two little quick anecdotes about Sylvester. Um, I was sort of a, a gaby, and uh, one of my good friends lived on Danvers Street, and it was just one of these epic homes with a pool and outdoor bar, and Sylvester lived next door, and he was just so free and easy to come over at these big parties with tons of boys and speedos and sing, and, and, and he was just very, very generous with his time, and, you know, he had an amazing spirit. Um, one other thing, too, of course, I saw him at the I-Beam, but the most epic show, and I wish that there was a video of this, and that's my question, uh, was at the Galleria, where he came out of this amazing smoking volcano, and it opened up, and he emerged from this volcano singing, and everybody was just floored. This was uh, an after party for uh, Gay Pride. I was just curious if there's pictures of that event. I can't confirm, you know, we could, I could do a little bit of homework and we could share that with you. But if you feel like we, we can pursue this sometime later when we can yeah. access the collection, Jeffrey. So feel free to email us and we'll see what we can do if we can locate those photographs. Because we do have a number of, of images and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, it probably was probably the most epic I guess, on stage come out you could have ever imagined and people were quite floored. The volcano was like 30 feet tall with smoke and everything and falling rubble and it, we, everyone was really pretty amazed. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you too. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing with us, Jeffrey. Um, so we just have a few minutes left of our program. I wanted to highlight um, some of the work that we have been doing here at the Society that Ramon mentioned. Um, so we actually have been putting up, uh, our wonderful archives team have been putting up primary source sets, and we actually have one for, uh, for Sylvester. So I'm going to share my screen here. So if you go to our website, which is glbthistory.org, and go to archives, if you go down to online resources, you should be able to see all of our uh, online collection uh, resources. We have our various digital collections, research guides, and uh, our primary source sets here. And if you click here and scroll down, we have some really wonderful primary source sets by topic, uh, different identities, different groups, different time periods. But we have down here, we have a whole primary source set on Sylvester, where you can see some really wonderful articles, images. Uh, here's our, our video that we showed tonight, uh, a little tribute, an audio tribute to Sylvester and other research guides here. So uh, please feel free to utilize our online collections, especially while we are closed down to the public. And we hope that uh, 
we hope that in the future we get to see everyone in the archives in person. And uh, thank you so much, Ramon, to oh, to you time. for sharing all of your expertise and stories. And thank you for <laughs> everyone sharing all of your memories and stories in the chat. This was really fun to uh, do with everyone and to celebrate. And you know, hopefully we can hopefully we can do it next time for Sylvester's birthday as well. Yes, maybe, we maybe planning, it'll be a yearly thing. And we are planning a museum opening sometime shortly. We'll, yes. I'm yeah. Sure we we, we are we are working on some video. language and we will be giving giving some updates to everyone very soon. So be happy, be healthy, be safe, everyone wear a mask and have a wonderful rest of your week. Happy birthday to Sylvester <laughs> and we will see you all soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.